Now on BBC One, Paul Ross has more stories from in and around our region with Inside Out. In tonight's show, we check out the latest in high-tech burglar alarms. Oh dear! You can't steal what you can't see. Is this man the greatest pilot of the 20th century? They were flying airplanes that had been designed for high speed, but these were the men who tested them. No, it's a very brave thing to do. And it could be you, except it won't be as we uncover a lottery scam. Why do we send off money to claim what are meant to be free prizes? Why do we grab at these prizes when we know that the odds are stacked so firmly against us? I'm Paul Ross, bringing you more surprising stories from familiar places. Stay tuned and you'll soon know Kent and Sussex inside out. <laughs> They say an Englishman's home is his castle. Why do they say that? Does every Englishman want six foot thick walls? Does he want a huge moat? Does he have a hankering for crinkly bits around the top of his roof? No, he just wants to feel safe. Many people are afraid of break-ins, but do you need to lock yourself in a castle to beat the burglars? Burglary is a despicable crime. It's bad enough if a thief robs you of your valuable possessions. But the emotional shock of having your personal property invaded can be deeply upsetting. This is the Kent home of Hillary. Hillary has never been burgled. She wants to keep it that way. I would think everyone's concerned about the crime figures in the country at the moment. I'm not paranoid about it, and I wouldn't let it rule my life, but um, yes, I think it is worrying. So Hillary is worried about the crime wave sweeping Kent. But there's just one small thing. It doesn't exist. But if you want to find out the true picture in Kent, there's only one thing to do. Ask a policeman. Because people think there's more burglary than there actually is. I think at the moment we're enjoying quite considerable success in reducing burglary. Around about 31% uh, reduction compared to this time last year. And for an area such as Maidstone, about 98,000 houses, uh, we really only see about two to three burglaries per day. In Sussex, the latest figures show that burglary has risen 10%, but the police say there's been a 24% increase in detection. Nevertheless, Hillary sees crime all around her. There have been a couple of fairly brazen um, incidents in the village where uh, there's been an armed burglary, um, a smash and grab at the newsagent, they drove right through the front, and I expect there's many more minor burglaries that I don't know of. So Hillary's house needs to be made secure, and here's someone who can help. He's worked in security for 20 years and knows a thing or two about keeping the burglars out. And he can tell us who exactly needs a security system. Almost everybody needs a security system. It's tempting to think that just wealthy people get burgled. The truth is, burglars will break in wherever they can. We give Hillary's house the once over, starting with the conservatory. I'm not too concerned about it, Paul, because this uh, has a lot of glass in it, and uh, you might think it was vulnerable, but in practice, thieves generally don't break in through conservatories. They'd need to break in twice. There's a very substantial door uh, into the main house, and there's not an awful lot of value in there anyway. And now we come on to uh, one of the more vulnerable bits of the house, I think. This is the kitchen, of course. Um, the door itself, actually, I'm not too concerned about, Paul. We've got um, two very good British standard five lever mortise locks on here. Uh, the door's quite substantial, so I don't think uh, really we've got too much of a problem with that. What does bother me is this window. Um, it's much older, it's probably the original one. Two little window locks, which is good, but it is a flimsy window, and I don't really think um, it would take our burglar too much time to get through this at all. 
the local neighbourhood watch refused to be interviewed for fear of reprisals. But they did tell us that many burglaries are not reported because of lack of confidence in the police and the local parish council agrees. The response to crimes is not everything you would wish. When you ring up, it's difficult to get through sometimes. It takes 10 minutes. And we do need to have crimes reported. And if it's difficult, they won't do it. Now, I know instances within the village where there's a serious crime and you get given a crime number and you never see a policeman. And that's just not acceptable. We are successful in reducing burglary and detecting those who commit burglaries. If the public don't report the crime to us, there's very little we can do. Now this window is a bit of a problem, it's the side of the lounge um, but it does have these external glazing bars which can be removed and the glass simply lifted out. And the second thing is the window is designed in such a way that it can actually be jemmied from both sides here so I am concerned about it. On the other hand of course we're here on the main road, it's quite busy, it's probably not the first point of call for a, for a burglar but nevertheless I am concerned about it and I think we do need to do something to protect these windows. What can we see here? Pile of bricks left conveniently placed by the owner um, for our thief to simply jump up and over the back gate and into the back garden. We've got to get rid of these. This is um, obviously security risk. And indeed, we, they could be used simply to break this window. So the obvious place for these to be locked up, out of sight, inside the workshop. OK, Paul, what do you think? Well, um, I'm quite impressed. It's not bad at all. I've done your survey, as you know, and um, there are a few weak points, but there's nothing in there we can't fix. And so the alarm system goes in. All done. And Hillary is given a basic lesson in her new security system. If it goes into a lock, this is what it sounds like. So far, so good. But there is one little thing extra. We've got a bit of a surprise for the burglar in this case. Paul has decided to install a special gadget in addition to the alarm. It's a smoke machine called a smoke cloak. What we're talking about is theatrical smoke, uh, the type of thing used in discos and so on, um, to fill parts of the house or, or commercial premises very quickly and make it impossible for the burglar to see what he's trying to steal. The smoke cloak doesn't normally look like this. This one is a temporary arrangement for demonstration purposes. You better stand back for this one. Okay. Thank you. The idea is either to scare the burglar away or make his job very difficult. You can't steal what you can't see. The Kent police have some tips on what to do about burglary. Three points. Make it as difficult as possible for a burglar to break into your home. Secondly, if you are away from your home, make it appear that you're still within your home. And thirdly, mark your property with maybe an ultraviolet pen, record your serial numbers. So if you are a victim of burglary, the police have the best opportunity possible to get your property back to you. Back at the house, everything is now secure. So no worries. Until this man turns up. Breaking and entering used to be his full-time occupation. His name is Bob Turney. We like to refer to him as Bob the Burglar. Can he nick it? Yes, he can. Now, you were a career burglar, yeah. but you weren't very successful, were you? No, no, I wasn't a good one. I wasn't a good one. How many years in prison did you spend? I spent on, on and off 18 years in and out of prison. Bob the burglar has now gone straight and works as a probation officer. But today, he's giving us the benefit of his criminal experience. He cases the joint to give us his thoughts on where a burglar may break in. Well, that's handy, secure. You can't get yeah, in there. but look, they got it bolted at the top here, look. How easy that is, look. And then we go. Simple as that. You're in. 
Conservatory port, I wouldn't touch it. It's double glazed, too solid. Even if I got in there, I'd look like a goldfish in a bowl. I'd be so exposed. No way then. No, no way, mate. Now, yeah, Paul, this could be a possibility. It's a bit small, but you know, it's single glazed, but it's stuff you've got to move off the shelf to get in. So, possibility, but we could, we'll have a look around. Okay. Bob the burglar casts his expert eye over the back patio. He appears to be drawn to the kitchen door. But no, he quickly spots something far better. Oh, this is definitely the one, Paul. It's so weak and flimsy, look. Nice sheet of glass like that, nobody in, bosh. You wouldn't be worried about the noise then, because no. smashing that is going to be noisy. Of course it is. But you know, you and just know there are houses over there sort of overlooking it. You're not worried about that? No, no. I mean, what are they going to do? Is it true to say that if somebody wants to get into your house and they're determined, they will? Yeah, they will. They will. Hillary's alarm system is in place. The time has come for the big test. Okay, brace yourself, Hillary. I think he's going to do it now. Off you go, Bob. Okay, here we go. God bless you. Thank you, Hillary. And so Bob demonstrates what a determined burglar can do, and straight away he finds a useful tool for the job. Oh, dear. What's that? You're like oh, that's right. Get a life out of me. What was that? Come out safely. Let me help you out. Find the glass on the carpet. Oh, dear, mate. Oh, it's completely impossible to see it. You can't see a thing in there. Now, you heard a few noises. You weren't too happy about that. What went through your mind? Well, it completely encased me. It was sort of like I was completely isolated from everything. It's really, you know, really did. That had me contained in there. But it would take you far longer to find anything in the room with this. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. It got, it got down to a, a sort of zero visibility yeah. situation Very pretty quickly. That was what was amazing. Was but, well, suddenly, it was a pea super. It was a bit of a surprise for you. <laughs> <laughs> somewhat, somewhat. You don't expect that, do you? Smoke alarm systems like this have been mainly used in commercial premises, such as warehouses up until now, because of the cost. How many people will install them in their homes remains to be seen. What will be your top tip, Bob, for people who want to deter burglars? Top tip is just to be sensible, just to be, you know, security conscious. If you've got a secure house, you're going to be all right, because they will move on to somewhere else. But don't forget, break-ins are quite rare, so whoever you are, don't have nightmares. Unless, of course, you happen to be a burglar. Coming up, the people who think they've won a prize. But now, reach for the sky with Chris Packham. I'm here at Goodwood in Sussex to meet one of the greatest aviators of the 20th century. A World War II fighter ace who went on to become a famous test pilot and who 50 years ago set the world speed record. And what's amazing is that he's still flying today. Neville Duke has been flying longer than anyone else in Britain. He got his wings in 1941 and has had a pilot's license ever since. The 81-year-old always flies with his wife, Gwen. She's 83, but she still pushes the plane out of the hangar before every flight. Now, Neville is a very reluctant hero. He hates any publicity or fuss, so I'm delighted that he's agreed to meet me. Neville, good yeah. morning. Hello. How are you? Fine, thanks. Yeah. Now, Neville, this is a charming little aircraft, but, yeah. it's, but it's not a Spitfire, is it? No. <laughs> How does it compare? Well, it's different. It really doesn't compare. <laughs> Neville is far too modest to mention this, but he was one of Britain's greatest wartime pilots. He fought in the skies over Europe and Africa for four years, flying Spitfires and American Tomahawk fighters. He shot down 28 enemy aircraft and survived two crash landings himself. Neville's wartime exploits made him famous in military circles, but it was when he came back to Britain that he really became a household name. 
he met his wife Gwen in 1947, just after he'd taken a demotion so that he could become a test pilot. He'd just come back from the war and he was offered three jobs, neither of which he wanted. And then they said, well, if you drop your rank, you could go and do a bit of testing at Hawker's. So he immediately dropped his rank and went to do some testing at Hawker's. Hawker Aircraft was one of the British companies developing the new generation of jet aircraft. Everybody wanted the fastest plane, so pilots like Neville had to test them to the limit. As their speeds approached the sound barrier, the race to be the quickest caught the public imagination. The test pilots became national heroes. Their fame was marked in all kinds of ways. Now, Neville, I've got a little bit of a surprise for you here. It might have been a few years <laughs> since you saw some of these. Now look at that. <laughs> Neville Duke's <laughs> test pilot card game. And here are the cards. There are a whole series of, of aircraft. And there's a, a small cartoon of yourself. Is that a fair representation of you as a younger man? About the right amount of hair, yes. <laughs> now look, Neville, it, for these to have been on on general sale points to the fact that test pilots in the 50s were celebrities. Yourself and your colleagues must have been, you know, extremely well known. I mean, were you featured in magazines and newspapers, mm, your yes, achievements celebrated yes. publicly like that? Yes. Oh. Yes, they were, Neville, yes. I, even I had to have people down for sort of to photograph the house and, you know, things like that. No, the, he liked the it. thing at that time was the, the sound barrier That's period. That's the thing, yes. That was built up into a bit of drama. In the early 50s? Yes. Yeah. Test pilots were admired for their skill and courage. The crowds that flocked to see them knew all about the dangers the pilots faced because fatal crashes were common. 1952 saw the worst accident of all. Neville's friend and fellow test pilot John Derry was killed when his plane disintegrated at Farnborough Air Show. Unfortunately, it was pointing at the crowd at the time, and although the wreckage fell on the runway, the engines kept going, and of course they had fuel in them, so they were still running like two torpedoes. 28 st Straight killed. into the crowd. 28 spectators died in the crash. Neville was waiting on the runway to take off, and in those days, the show had to go on. The routine, I think, at farm if anything like that happens, is they, they encourage you to keep the show going, to keep the crowd's attention away from the yeah. disaster. Despite the risk, Neville continued as a test pilot, and a year later, he achieved his greatest triumph, setting a new airspeed record. He's offered to fly me along the route where the record was set, so I'm taking to the air with a man who's been flying for 62 years. In 1953, Neville took off from nearby Tangmere airfield and headed for the Sussex coast. Now, the airspeed record was measured at sea level, so Neville flew his Hawker Hunter flat out along the seafront between Bognor and Worthing Piers. Today, thankfully, we're going at a much more gentle pace. Takeoff to landing was under 15 minutes. You're close inshore, but the noise must have been terrific. But as far as I know, we didn't get any complaints. Apparently, it took just 10 seconds for the Hunter to go up this stretch of coastline. Pretty fast. Neville had to fly back and forth four times. Observers timed how long he took to fly between two points three kilometres apart and then worked out his average speed over the four runs. Neville averaged 727 miles an hour and returned in triumph to Tangmere. He had won the world airspeed record back from the Americans. Among the crowd waiting to greet him was his engineer, Dougie. Everybody were clapping and cheering. He sat in the copy for some moments, doing his normal shutdown. And then he slowly took his helmet off, the great white helmet. And uh, very gradually, he sort of stood up in the cockpit. And, oh yes, they gave him a welcome. Neville! 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 Neville!
an Englishman. You know, that's what it's all about. We've got the record. Gwen. Bye-bye. Thank Bye-bye, you very please. much. It was a pleasure Thank to you. meet you. Be Bye-bye, careful boys. in that wild blue yonder, won't you? Yeah. <laughs> Be careful. Bye-bye, lads, and thanks a lot. You've been marvellous. Thank you. Bye-bye. Next up, we investigate a lottery that's not what it seems. From the moment Tom White paid to enter a competition, letters from around the world poured into his Southampton home. They tell him he's been specially selected, that he's already won a prize or has a fantastic chance to do so. All he has to do is send a cheque. Now Tom's name has been sold for about a pound a time to people who think he can be enticed to part with his cash for prizes. I thought, well, if I could get a couple of holidays out of this lot, that'll keep me happy. Enough money to get myself a decent car instead of the old car I've got outside. So I entered a competition. But I didn't think it was going to turn out like this. It's just like a tide coming in. And I can't turn it back. King Canute can, but I can't. You know the sort of thing. They seem to promise you a big cheque in return for a small one of your own. I think they're working on elderly, gullible people. Thinking, oh, I've got enough there. I can win enough there for a holiday or enough there for a car or get my house done. And they're paying all the silly money, but um, they're all taken for idiots. Complete idiots. And it's costing them money. Everyone's a winner, baby, that's your life. That's the life. You never fail. You're satisfied. satisfied. Now, most of us know that when we receive something through the post that suggests we've won a prize worth thousands of pounds, it's simply too good to be true. So why do we fall for it? Why do we send off money to claim what are meant to be free prizes? Why do we grab at these prizes when we know that the odds are stacked so firmly against us? Ross? I think the, the issue is it says that you're already a winner um, and so you keep going wanting to be a winner again. <laughs> Almost. You want to be a winner again. Um, and, and that is the nature of gambling. It's intermittent reinforcement. If you win once, you will keep going, even for years, uh, expending loads of money to get that high, that stimulation of the win yet again. Certainly, as a psychologist, what I would suggest that they did was throw the letters out. Don't open them up, don't read them, because I think that's the nature of the addiction. You suddenly visualise this wonderful get-rich-quick scheme. Don't do that. Um, bin them before you open them. One of the most misleading letters came from TV Direct Distribution. It tells people they're the big winner of a £10,000 cheque. Here you are, on the list of big winners at last. Nothing will now prevent you from receiving the cheque for £10,000. It's stamped, confirmed and certified, awaiting dispatch in 48 hours. The good news comes with a mail order catalogue whose products seem designed to appeal to pensioners. The suggestion is that if you order something, you'll get the £10,000 more quickly. The letters, checks and orders flood into Tottenham, Hampshire at the rate of £100,000 a day. Emery acts as a forwarding company for a French firm, Biotonic, which operates TV Direct Distribution. It's one of the most complained about lottery mail order outfits in France, because that's what you've actually applied for. Entry to a lottery which you have virtually no chance of winning. If you want to get some idea of the scale of this operation, I can tell you that in this small but very busy office, no less than 12,000 replies are dealt with every day. And of those, 55% come complete with orders. There's one here for £124. And on an exceptional day, 30,000 replies can turn up here. I find it absolutely staggering that that many people are sticking stamps and putting these things in the post box. Emery has confirmed that the elderly are targeted by the French, but it says that Biotonic is doing nothing illegal. You don't get anything for nothing these days. It might look like a free ride, 
if people haven't done anything, why is somebody going to give them 10,000 quid? You know, and all they've done is received an envelope in the post from somebody they don't know saying, you've won £10,000. Would you believe it? I wouldn't. But like countless others, Wendy Verio of North Baddersley did think she'd won. She ordered some stove cleaner and waited for her £10,000 to arrive. When I receive a letter, I think, oh great, £10,000 in my pocket. And I thought they were truthful. And I thought, well, ordering one item over £25 is nothing. If I'm going to get £10,000, I feel that I'd like to choke them. Because it's not been fair on me. When you're living on your own, you look for letters, yes. But when you get these sort of letters, but from now on, it's taught me a lesson. No more things out of catalogues or anything. If I'm going to buy anything, I'll go to the shop. That's what it's fit for. While it disapproves of aspects of its French client's business, Emery says that if it didn't act for Biotonic, someone else would. And it's brought 30 jobs to Totten, processing the prize draw entries and mail orders. You're basically the British face of, of this business. Yes. Because they're based overseas in France and Belgium. Yeah. At times, is that a bit of a burden for you, particularly when it comes to complainants? Uh, we have to keep nudging the wheel and trying to point the client company in a more British direction. And we do that. Um, we work with them and we are endeavouring to um, soften their approach. Unfortunately, their approach works. Biotonic haven't had things all their own way. They've been sending out similar letters in France. 74-year-old Juliette Warin took Biotonic to court. The retired factory worker called the company dishonest. She said she never broke her word, she didn't see why they should. And last December, she won her case. Biotonic was ordered to pay her the money. She decided to buy some new blinds and give the rest of it to her daughter. Biotonic told us the games are just a sales promotion tool and that they're set up in accordance with French law. It says the rules of the game are always included and make it clear how the game operates. People are not charged to enter and they're not obliged to buy goods. Biotonic does say it plans to add some additional words to help the elderly understand what they're getting into. As the Office of Fair Trading begins an investigation here, which could lead to a prosecution, how can British pensioners get over their disappointment? I think they should get angry. I mean, I, I have this vision of kind of phalanxes of old age pensioners, you know, storming the barricades and going against these companies because they are being cynically targeted. And if they answer a newspaper ad, then the newspaper is selling their addresses. So they're getting inundated, um, imagining that they're just sort of passive people um, rich for the picking. So I wouldn't, uh, you know, try and help them overcome all of this. I, I'd help them get angry. Now, if you want any more information and to have your say about tonight's show, visit our website, bbc.co.uk slash inside out. Coming up next week... A life on the ocean wave. We tempt a reluctant group of Kent teenagers to take up a career at sea. The sky's big. Massive. It's well big. The scratch card prizes that cost you money. And abracadabra. Can a magician survive in the wild woods of Sussex? <laughs> oh, it's going to burn me! Oh, shoot! <laughs> Coming up, EastEnders. See you next week.